do in movie theaters too. We're gonna we leave this. We keep a gap between. Yeah. That's for the tub of popcorn. Boy girl, Is boy it? girl, we're yeah. fine. That's right. That's right. So Ahsoka's untold tales. Till till now, I suppose. Yeah. Till now. <laughs> Makes sense. Sure. Until this hour. Yeah, this, this moment, title has kept yeah. me awake at night a little bit. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I was I was joking earlier that we would go five minutes and then just go into Q and A, but I I won't do that <laughs> quite yet. So there's an empty chair next to you. We're missing yes. somebody. Yes, it's almost symbolic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> it, it begins. Well done, sir. Thank you. I have tons of those. All right, whoever could we stick in this chair? Well, why don't we bring up Ahsoka herself, Ashley Eckstein. Come on up, Ashley. Give it up for Ashley, come on. Hi. <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> I know. Papa, yeah. we're twins. We got twins. We're representing there. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, you have to show off your shirts, your matching Absolutely. shirts there. Absolutely. Does everybody recognize these shirts and where they come from? Anyone see the end of season two of Star Wars Rebels? They're, they're Italian shirts. <laughs> they're designed by Filoni. They're Filoni. So they're very yeah. Actually, they're exclusive. I, <laughs> Dave, I call it the House of Filoni yeah. because he's actually quite an accomplished fashion designer for you her universe. You wouldn't know it, but <laughs> I got my old wolf on. So, so you've, done a lot of, you've done a lot of designs for Ashley. Yeah, universe over the, she over calls years. me like, I need to design quickly. <laughs> Desperate. So I'm like, all right. And I just find something on my desk. I'm like, um. That. I'm not using that. I just scan it and email it. <laughs> no, I put thought into it, of course. Yeah. Symbolic nature. Is she alive? Is she dead? The shirt won't tell you. Oh, well, here's so, the thing. You know, you think it does. You, th you get late at night, you stare at it, you wonder, is that an A for Ahsoka? A for alive? Or... A for, for almost, or, or, or a Greek D for dead, or something. A yeah. for afterlife, that's yeah. awful. Oh. See? Hey, See? you're all thinking it, come on. All right, well, we should start at the beginning, yeah, though. Yeah, let's talk about it. So, now, Soka's, she's been with us for almost a decade at this point, mm. as a character coming up on it. This is the character that you came up with with George mm -hmm. Lucas. Talking about uh, about uh, you know the Jedi Order, Ahsoka starts as a Padawan, but where she goes is just so unexpected, so incredibly awesome. <laughs> I mean, you know, from going from being Anakin's Padawan to being Fulcrum, and everything in between. What are the untold tales of Ahsoka <laughs> that we that you're going to treat us to today? Well, I just happened to bring a presentation, so boy, <laughs> we lucked out here. That's really handy that yeah, you brought yeah. that presentation. Yeah. <laughs> So if we flip the slides, um, basically, you know, Dave is, has done a lot of exploration regarding uh, uh, where Ahsoka came from. There's the behind-the-scenes story that I think we've told quite a bit in terms of, you know, you were brought on to the show, you, you were surprised to hear George tell you that Anakin had a Padawan. Yeah, no one knew. No yeah. one knew. And, uh, but beyond that, there's actually the origin that exists in the universe. So. What I did leading into this, uh, we had some, some of the crew pull together some of uh, Dave's sketches. And this is, you've seen a little bit of this. This actually appeared in one of the episodes. This was yeah. the finding of Ahsoka Tano by Plo Koon. Yeah, I try to squeeze as much into these shows as I can when we're making them, because I just never know sometimes you know, television how far we'll get. So the image of Ahsoka as a young girl, and I wanted to, to show kids a different take uh, on how Jedi find kids. It's not always that they're in a terrible situation, that they're growing up in a horrible life. Sometimes, you know, she might have come from a town that seemed to be excited about her being taken by the Jedi and being initiated to become a Jedi when she was discovered uh, within the Republic to have uh, the right stuff, you know, that they would come and get her. And this is something that would uplift the whole town. So I actually wrote a story um, a fable around what it was like for her uh, to grow up in that situation before the Jedi came to get her. Uh, and a lot of that story, as I like to make my Star Wars stories have very clear messages, was about kind of old sayings like, don't judge a book by its cover, you know, uh, the way someone looks can deceive you. And so this here was a, a character uh, called Latrans that I was uh, investigating, developing, and it was a, a Jedi that appeared very fair, 
uh, and seemed very kind and had all the things that you'd like to attribute to a Jedi, the flowing robes, kind of long graceful hair, a beautiful alien look. Uh, but actually, and I think the next slide shows you that it was actually a, a bounty hunter in disguise. And I had surmised that because Jedi children were very rare and, and imbued with the force that there would be people in the galaxy that would want to kidnap them and take them away. So while the town had really recognized where Ahsoka grew up, that she was a potential Jedi, and they thought this would be great for the town and make them famous in their little sector, uh, it was also dangerous because if people intercepted the message to the Jedi that they would come and try and kidnap her, and the town, not having ever seen a Jedi, right. uh, wouldn't know a Jedi from a non-Jedi. So the, the story was about that really, and this design of this character, Latrans, actually later I developed into um, the Zygerians, which turned up in uh, Star Wars Clone Wars, and you can see the queen of Zygeria there, and remember her from that yeah. story arc. She looked a little more, you know, kind of rat-like or mousy there, and I wanted the Latrans to be more like a coyote person, mm -hmm. a trickster, someone that's deceptive, so that was kind of a how I developed that, uh, that story, which, which we haven't figured out a way to do yet. I've actually played at animation. We've talked about the bell and being in it in some way as a hopefully possible format of the future. But uh, this was Plo Koon when he shows up. And Plo Koon's like the opposite of Latrans. Like, right, he's creepy. He's got like the pointy clawed hand and he looks really sinister. He's got like a Kylo Ren vibe to him with his mask. And, and these are just you know, scans. I mean, you can see the spiral bow. These are just scans yeah. right out of your notebook, right? It's out of my sketchbook yeah, that yeah, I yeah. just kind of doodle in all day. So, so when yeah. you're making these, you're just, are you in story meetings when you're doing this with George, or is this something that's Could be that's anywhere just, your lunch on just... a Southwest flight. It doesn't matter. Right, like right, right, right. anywhere I have time, you know, to draw and doodle, I will uh, try to come up with imagery. It's all about getting images out of your head and getting them down on paper and then people can take them somewhere else. I mean, how much of that have I been able to exploit? Because Ralph McQuarrie and Joe Johnson and all those artists did so many sketches that they left behind and said, well, I like that walker and they never used it. So I try to brain dump as much stuff that George and I talked about or that I've thought about so that, you know, who knows in the future. I, I actually have a folder of Dave's doodles huh. um, because we've been working together since 2006. And during our sessions and, and events, he's always doodling. I mean, I have one from the breakfast uh, placemat one time when really? we all had breakfast. Yeah. And so I literally have a folder of Dave's doodles of over the years since 2006. Every time you say Dave's doodles, I see a book coming to you in 2018 <laughs> called <laughs> Dave's Doodles, The Art of... <laughs> no, a more graceful title than that, maybe. But... No, Dave, no, it's... Oh, yeah, well. I mean, I, can we talk about the editing process, though? Because there are so many ideas Ideas. I feel like we just passed two or three shows on its own that I would mm. be interested in watching. You know, just Ahsoka as a child, <laughs> the idea of yeah. the Jedi finding younglings and that whole process. There's so much we haven't seen. Uh, how, how do you edit, the, how, do you, how did you go, for example, from the, the Coyote character into what eventually appeared on the Clone Wars? What's that process like? Well, you, you really have to choose in production, when am I going to get a chance to do that? And the fact is that telling a story about Ahsoka as a very young girl, while I am excited about that, I know other people that would, would that appeal to a mass audience? Is that going to be worth what I have to economically put into the production, right? So you're always asking yourselves, like, <laughs> you know, there's the money in and money out. And, you know, people want to know that if they invest so much money to produce the show, that they're going to see that back. That's the reality of filmmaking. As a storyteller, I want to tell as many stories as I can, so I try to get them all down. But the reality is that you have to look at it from an economic viewpoint, and how am I going to get that told? So I take ideas, and I start to seed them in. So a, a coyote person exists in Star Wars because I was able to get them in somewhere. Ahsoka as a little child design exists in Clone Wars because I was able to find a way to get the idea that Plo Koon found her, it's in the dialogue and you see it in a flashback kind of foreshadowing moment, right? So I find sneaky ways to get things in and then later on, if we need to develop it into a, a, a bigger thing, people have something to look at and right. go, okay, you, so I guess this is what he meant. You've done the exploration mm -hmm. of to, you know, what is this scene like? Yes, she is. So, yeah. Oh, See how yeah. cute She's you so were. Cute. Yeah. So this is, this is what all happened? that surface. This is like the very beginning uh, montage and the opening of the, the, the younglings arc. Mm -hmm. 
So okay. we're able to surface just that little piece of story, but if you ever wondered, there was a whole backstory behind that. So, so here's a tricky thing too. You see Plo Koon's hand there, and you'll notice that he's got a clone armor gauntlet on that they wore as Jedi in the Clone War. Now, this scene would technically take place years, years before that, but for production, I didn't have the budget and ability to spend money on just changing his forearm. So for wide shots of it, we just textured that clone armor to look like wrapped cloth. So it looks more like his Phantom Menace cloak outfit. And then this shot is not that long and hopefully you're looking at Ahsoka's face. So you see the line of his arm just takes you right to her face. And then this object here cuts you off and keeps you right there. So you do that stuff and you just kind of, it goes by, everyone's excited about her. And that's a little cinematic cheat. Because there's so many other areas you need to spend your money on in production, you want to waste it on changing an arm. And she's the one that's lit. She's the one that's, uh, that, yeah. So, and, and no bit goes unused, it seems, in Star no. Wars. And that's certainly the case no. uh, with a lot of these explorations that you've done. Totally. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We're, we're still mining untold stories. And, and you know, it's, it's great to have a place like this to talk about them. But just because we talk about them now doesn't mean, okay, we're done with that story. We put it out in the world, we're done with it. No, it's like this is just peeling back the layer and letting you see some, some bits and pieces here. So this next section, as you know, we mm -hmm. talked about it last celebration. Uh, when the Clone Wars series ended production, there were, there were three Ahsoka arcs still left to tell. And we'll get into some of them right now. park and she's literally sitting at the edge of the park with these kind of trees behind her and it was in autumn and she's looking through the gap in these buildings at the Jedi Temple and she's making a further decision at that point because if you missed the other episodes am I going to really walk away from that or go back because of course like any teenager she would have an impulse to say I'm gonna go back what was I thinking now I'm afraid but uh, George and I talked about that and we shot it but then for time I had to cut from the episode but there was this period then where you realized this kid was raised in a temple. She really has no idea how to deal with the real world. Right. She has no idea how to buy a speeder. She has no idea what it means to have a cost per year living. I mean, there are all these kind of interesting things that you start to think about and then apply to how you write the story. So that's a little bit, she has a heavy burden now just trying to live as a normal person on Coruscant. And exploring her costume was another I didn't want her costume to be a Jedi-like look because that would be bad for her on the outside world. Uh, so I was trying to develop different looks uh, of things that were reminiscent of being a Jedi, but, but not so much. And we eventually developed it further from there. Um, I don't know if that's, yeah, to this one, which was kind of a more pop-influenced uh, Japanese kind of outfit that uh, the, the only thing about this was I called you because I wanted to put an animal on the boot of Ahsoka. And I said, I, I want to put an animal on, the, on her boot. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you want? And you said? I said, I want a monkey. A monkey. And it, I hate monkeys. Like, <laughs> I really do. I didn't know that. And I was like, uh, what, a, what a way to find out. Right? I know. But how fair is that? I did it anyway, yeah. put the boot monkey on there. But I was just like, because to me, like, you know, John Favreau, who played Pre Vizsla, did a great movie recently, Jungle Book, which was the, the best pro-wolf anti-monkey movie of all time. And if you've ever seen it, it really stresses the point of how great the wolves are and how bad the monkeys are. And so that was, I was all about that. But yeah, boot monkey over here. But I did it anyway. It was nice. I thought it was a lemur. It's more of a lemur because they're a little more like dogs. So oh, I can kind of get there with a the lemur, but... You settled on that after you, you explored the Kowakian monkey lizard first. Yeah, I, di I did that too, but you notice in that episode, they're really mean. Yes. They try to hurt those right. nice little birds. They're nasty <laughs> things. Right, right, so just right, trying right. to you know, express to kids what's going on here. And <laughs> dog is your friend, just remember. Right, right, right. So, Ashley, do you hear a lot of these stories <laughs> in advance? Like, how much of this do you discuss in the studio, or is it... Uh, yes and no. I, mm. I feel like we're on a need-to-know basis. Yes. Dave, 
<laughs> Especially more and more. <laughs> what does this mean, Dave? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, Dave does an amazing job before every episode painting the picture of what's happening in that episode, leading up to it, usually right after it. Um, but, you know, he gives us what we need to know to give the performance we need to give. Um, so, for example, in between from when she walks away and when she comes back in Rebels, you know, Sam Witwer and I know an important part because we had to know it for our performance in Rebels. Mm -hmm. But there's so much of that time that I don't know um, because I guess I don't need to. But once, <laughs> once we went to film it, I sat down and told you and Sam the story of what happened because then it became real. Yeah. So, oh, no, did your thing go out? I, I, I will say, <laughs> I'll put him on the spot right now, but honestly, Dave is one of the best, if not the best directors I've ever worked with. Um, truly. Yeah, give it up. And Terrible. It's, it's an actor's dream to work with somebody like him because he paints such a vivid picture. And as an actor, you know exactly what you need to give because of the picture he paints. But you still don't know what happened to it, so. <laughs> no, okay, so now I can So go back maybe to I'm me. not that good, but, <laughs> but I take you right, because what did I tell you? Because you were asking me, and I said, but if I told you what happened, that would affect what you do. Right. So I can't tell you that, because she doesn't know in that moment that when she fights Darth Vader, she doesn't know what, that would be untrue, it would be untruthful. Yeah. So you would have no way of inflecting or telegraphing an inflection of one yeah. way or the other if you as an actor don't know on the microphone what's gonna happen. No, it's, it's true. And, and also one thing, he gets to know each actor individually mm -hmm. and gives specific direction on what we need to get to that place. Right. So, cause some of these scenes are incredibly emotional and um, we have to go to a certain place to get there. And, and keep in mind, it's not live action, it's just animation. So we're not looking at the scene, they do the animation afterwards. So we literally have to make up this scene in our head that we've never seen before and we know very little about, the only way to do that is through really great direction. And now, is part of the reason why you don't always share what happened from point A to point B is because you want to leave yourself some flexibility to change it? In other words, even though you're telling stories in Rebels timeline, you're telling stories in a Clone Wars timeline, the time in between might still be in flux in terms of what you're solidifying? Yeah, well, the hard part is that once we do something, if we... we Clone Wars is here, and then we jump to Rebels, then this is going to, by nature, become more solid. Because the character then has to react to things, and I go, OK, well, if she's had to have this experience. I have to make some decisions, which is why, while I'm writing that story, I have to go back and figure out kind of the one in between to some degree and say, well, this happened, this happened, this happened. And it becomes a lot more realistic in my mind. Um, if there was anything forward or not, then that's still in play. But you always have to be careful that you don't corner yourself. And now the continuity is so wide. I mean, that's one of the things Pablo and I, Pablo and I have always been in communication over the years, dating back to Clone Wars, to try and get things straight. Mm -hmm. And there would always be little changes in continuity that would make him and Leland Chi aware of. And now, you know, we just have really on-the-fly office meetings. I'm like, this might happen, and this might happen. If someone's writing a book, this might happen, or this is happening. And, it's, it's a lot more difficult to keep it all straight, but we do as a group, and that's, that's the key thing, because once it's down, as a fan, you want to be able to believe in that story and that character in that moment, so. Well, let's, look, let's get back to the PowerPoint here sure. uh, and, and move <laughs> forward. So let's see um, what else we can talk about in Untold so, Tales. Ooh, what's this? So in Ahsoka's Walkabout, uh, it was her story of living out in the real world. Yeah. And the, uh, the most real world you can get for at least as far as a contrast from someone who lives in the loftiest heights of the Jedi Temple is the very depths of Coruscant mm. going down to the sketchy level 1313. Mm -hmm. And here Ahsoka meets a, uh, a scoundrel by the name of Nix Okami. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have some, some art of him here. Yeah, um, it's cool, go ahead, keep on. Well, I mean, what, what's interesting, and, and and I, I hesitate to bring this up because it, it, it sets the internet afire all the time, right? Okay. So um, I know there's a, a contingent here that have a very strong opinion regarding Ahsoka and Lux. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, she must have a thing for people whose names end with X because uh, Ahsoka and Nyx 
they, they get kind of close in, the, in this arc. They which, did, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, Nick's Okami, and he's got a great jacket with a wolf on the back of it. Uh, of course <laughs> And you can see that straight away. He's got style. Um, Nick's was also an attempt. I wanted to have an Asian male lead in Clone Wars, and he was going to be kind of a character bringing that to the forefront, which is really excited about. Um, and yeah, he, Ahsoka kind of, it's this almost this, uh, like, I don't want to say completely John Hughes, but it is really kind of like a teenage story about her and what she does on her own, kind of, and, and she can, if you think about it, be just a norm, whatever a normal kid in Star Wars is at that age. She doesn't have the big responsibilities of the galaxy anymore, but that's going to be a huge struggle for her. So it was a great character kind of look at, at what she gets into, and she gets wrapped up kind of in the smuggling world and the underworld with uh, crime syndicates and everything. Not that she's with them, she's actually still against them, and that's her problem. She has a very clear moral center. Even though she's not technically a Jedi anymore, that doesn't mean that she's not going to behave like one. But if she does, it would be very dangerous for her. So it's a big challenge for her to be around these other characters. And, and also, like as far as anything romantic with the character, which I explored a little bit, um, with with I mean, Lux. I feel like we're beating around the bush here. What is that? Ahsoka had a boyfriend for a hot minute, and his name is Nick Okami. <laughs> is that is that what, <laughs> is that what you, you said that, not me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess because I don't know. I'm more paternal on the character. I don't think in those terms actually. <laughs> I have a hard time with that. But I don't know. I've always wanted to like as far as a romance. We never did a really big out of Anakin and Padme a big romantic thing with any character in Clone Wars, but. With Ahsoka, I was very careful to try to represent to, especially young girls, the idea that they don't have to make these decisions very black and white. They don't yeah. have to just be with someone because. That just like her decision to leave the Jedi, she can do independent things because that's what she chooses to do. That she can have her own identity, her own agency, her own character, and see value in that and not just put that value I'm important because somebody else likes me, which is yeah. often a thing you see in stories. So a lot of her romantic stories were around that, moreover, and not Absolutely. about being mm -hmm. with someone vis-a-vis -vis, that's the standard. So Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just joking, giving you a hard time, but the, <laughs> the way that the story what? was written <laughs> is, is very, I mean, it was awesome. It, was, it, it, was, it wasn't about Ahsoka just having a crush on a boy <laughs> at all. It was, it was really how stories should be told for teenage girls having crushes, and yeah. it uh, it was beautifully written, and it was um, a real growing and learning experience for her. Yeah, and especially with all the circumstances that has changed for her, because you know, um, w what's interesting is she she keeps the fact that she is a Jedi or was a Jedi secret from Nyx. Because Nix's point of view, he embodies a lot of what the lower Coruscant level is. It's like, you're, you're a person of privilege up there who's never had to work a hard day. Like, that's, you know, it's not accurate, but that's how he sees what the surface world is like. And Ahsoka recognizes that if she is <laughs> open about where she comes from, she's instantly putting a wall in between her and the people that she now has to live with, you know? And he doesn't like Jedi. Yeah, exactly. And you are a Jedi. Yeah. So you don't want to reveal that. Eh? Yeah, it's interesting. I know a lot of people probably be like, oh, I don't know. I want to see Ahsoka involved in a battle like with Darth Vader, a big thing. But you have to remember, like, when I watch TV series like Robotech or Macross, the fundamental backbone of that thing was a romance. It was all about Rick, Lisa, and Minmay. When mm -hmm. I watched Star Wars, one of the things that captivated me the most was when in, in, in Empire, when you realize that Han and Leia have this relationship that's growing. And what does that mean for Luke? It's those character conflicts that you create that make the bigger world mean so much more because now there's something at stake that you believe in. So there was still epic high adventure all around oh, yeah. that. But, but there that was, was the back that continued through it. Yeah. Unless you don't get nervous. Well, and it humanizes, humanizes Ahsoka as well in a, mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that you hadn't really seen before. Yeah. So it's fair to say that she leaves the Jedi Order. She would have to kind of almost go back to level 13, 13, or somewhere to hide out in the seedy underbelly, of course. She's more comfortable there because it's more of an extreme environment. Right. She moves from one extreme to the other. Because even though she's out of the temple, she has a, she has a certain set of skills, yeah. right? Yeah. So like, you, you figure you have to find a place to be an outcast, so go where the other outcasts are. Yeah, or, or. and there were, I mean, at this, at this stage, when we get into these further episodes, this is the next arc, we're really only just talking about scripts and some artwork. 
But there was some description of Ahsoka, even though she's trying to carve out a life for herself, she can't change who she is. And she becomes kind of a undercity vigilante to some degree, helping people who can't help themselves, you know? Um, so we have some, some art here. <laughs> this is an arc that would have, again, started with her <laughs> in the depths of Coruscant, and circumstances um, would have brought her back to the surface. So, again, yeah, I so started to develop different costumes again. I always like to change that up. Um, I was actually trying to do something that was a, in some ways reminiscent of Ventress, uh, also reminiscent of uh, the sister on Mortis. There were certain elements that she was playing with in her costume. So these are just doodles. And these, I would do these when George and I were talking about the story. So I would sit and be drawing the whole time as he and I are talking about it. So these are just some really early you can see that like on the, the kind of skirt element, she's got a three panel thing going on. And I actually kept that with that type of belt pretty much in Rebels. Mm -hmm. But that was done years ago, year before we even thought of Star Wars Rebels. So. so the arc of it would essentially, you'd find out that some nefarious entities, and I won't go into what, um, are at work in the depths of Coruscant and have gone so far as to <laughs> endanger Master Yoda. Yes. And. Uh, our heroes go into the depth, they, uh, Ahsoka joins them in this search, and, as, and this is the arc where you would have found out, this is their, their exploration vehicles. Yeah. Th this is the arc yeah. that you would have found out that deep, deep, deep beneath Coruscant surface, deep beneath the Jedi Temple is an ancient Sith Temple. The base level. Yeah. The really? base level one, yeah. When you get to the root of Coruscant, um, I said to George, you know, a lot of uh, churches and things are actually built on ancient pagan sites. So what if we got really far down and there was some kind of dark side of the force area that's so many levels below the Jedi Temple, but that's why they built the Jedi Temple there because they had defeated that and years later they had built above it. So what you see there in the center is like these massive pillars that are holding up everything above it, but it's literally vertical straight down below and inside there was like this kind of giant infernal machine, I was have all these big gears that were turning, it would be within our budget, Athena, but it was gonna be, my producer's <laughs> here, but it was gonna be amazing. Uh, but yeah, we never got to do it, but I drew it. We did so. draw it, yeah. This, is... this was a confrontation I told you about, because Pablo gets all this stuff, and I don't always make notes about what they are. And I said, do you know what that is? And he said, no, but this was a moment where Ahsoka was actually protecting the holocron vault uh, and by impaling her lightsaber in this doorway to melt it shut. And Sidious was actually on the other side of this big door, sending force lightning up her lightsaber blade wow. and out the other side to attack her. So there was this, that was as close a confrontation between yeah. the two of them we, that they we never, got. They never got face to face. They always had this yeah, barrier between them. Yeah, there was a barrier them, between them. But, but yeah. you saw a battle going on between both of them. That had been a cool effect, yeah. yeah. You don't want to fight that. You'd no. probably lose that one. So the door is good. The door is good for you. You would lose that one. Yes. Yeah. I Sorry. Know. You're saying, please continue. <laughs> so the the whole purpose of that particular arc was bring Ahsoka back. She's not a Jedi. She doesn't change her decision, but she gets involved in Jedi business again. And the war is still going on, and she's a responsible person. So she's not someone who's going to run away from responsibilities. Well, because she has a lack of trust with the political aspect of the Jedi. Yeah. And she, because what Barriss says sinks in, and there's a lot of truth to what Barriss says she believes. So, but she still trusts Anakin, and she trusts Obi-Wan. So she does have people that she believes in that she wants to help in this galactic time of crisis, basically. Yeah, so one of the final arcs, really the final arc of the series as proposed, yeah. um, would have reunited Ahsoka with uh, the clone troopers, with Anakin. So they would have seen each other one last time before the encounter in Rebels. Yeah. Uh, this that is the last is heartbreaking scene. right yeah. there, by the way. I have well. to say, it's like, uh, you simple drawing, wh whatever. Like, especially after season two finale, like, I see that and it just stirs up a lot of emotion about, about the last time they saw each other. And then, well, it was so, really cool. I'll tell you. It was I'll really cool. I'll tell you a story okay. really quickly. I'll, to be fair, because I'm going to say so nothing later, but... Um, <laughs> At this point, and I think I can say this, I don't think this is bad. Pablo, when Pablo and I, now we're in trouble together, which is sure, good. Yeah, yeah. So what happened was that Ahsoka was working with the Mandalorian Bo-Katan, because Ahsoka knew Satine. So she was working with Bo-Katan, and Bo-Katan 
figures out when Maul is back on Mandalore, because Maul has been a shadow terrorizing them and still wielding control over them politically through Prime Minister Almec. Very complex politics in Clone Wars, remember. So they realize he's back on Mandalore and they have an opportunity to get him. And she knows that that's really important to Obi-Wan. If it's important to Obi-Wan, it's important to Anakin. So she and Bo-Katan contact the Jedi and say, we have this opportunity. We know where Maul is, we can get him. So she meets with Anakin and Obi-Wan in person. Yeah. And they say, okay, we're gonna do this and we're gonna back you. And there's this great moment uh, where they're kind of together, but then they get a, a call from Master Yoda, interrupts the whole plan, and he says, I need Skywalker and Kenobi back to Coruscant immediately. The city's been attacked and the Chancellor's been taken prisoner. So they have to go off on that mission, which is the beginning of Revenge of the Sith, yeah. and Ahsoka goes off the other direction. What happens is this nice long walk down the hallway where Anakin expresses how proud he is of Ahsoka and everything she's achieved, and even though she left, you know, he understands it to some degree. He's not completely happy about it still, but he gets it's kind of worked out. Don't get emotional. Are you, and, right? Are you okay there? And so you'll be fine. <laughs> At least you will be. And um, what happens is that he says, well, I'm not going to leave you on this mission. I'm protected. And these, these hangar doors open up and reveals all these clones standing there from half the 501st. And they're all now wearing orange helmets and orange striped helmets like her. And Rex is there, and Anakin has given Rex's command unit to Ahsoka to go and attack Mandalore with Bo-Katan and take back the planet. And so that's why Rex also isn't in the movie. See, it all makes sense. Are you yes. trying oh to make gosh. us cry? <laughs> and then it was great, because when the doors open, the doors open, David, they all like salute, and they all no. get like that, and they all like, and it's this moment, and you see, you see this little, you know, what was a little girl standing there, and now she's grown, and she has command of this whole Would thing. Would you look at what you did? And she's not, what's wrong with you? That's exciting, that's happy. When you, why are you doing that? This is a happy thing. Oh my gosh, it's no wonder I don't tell you the ending. Anyway, um, this is the opposite, this is the opposite reaction. This is, this is like, a, no, but in the movie, it's like, yeah, go, get them all. Get them, capture them all, get that witware. It's a much more. Get that witware. It's a much more exciting thing, and it's Rex and Ahsoka. It would have been you and Dee. That, but you know. Anyway. It, it makes the season two finale that much more heartbreaking. <laughs> it makes the season two finale that much more heartbreaking. Why? No which, well, which? Yeah, knowing. Oh, you mean in Rebels? Story. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, but we were all young ones. It's fine. It's good. It makes her a real person. It's yes. good. It's good for you. It's good for you. So. Look, there's Sam. I mean, Maul, on his throne. <laughs> And yeah, with, here, here she is leading the charge. Leading, le leading oh the charge. Oh my gosh. It's exciting though, it's leading the charge. It's happy. Oh. Yeah. Look how she looks happy there. Focus, <laughs> Thank happy. You. And, Thank you, yeah. my gosh. What happened to me? Look at all the clones. The clones have jetpacks, Mandalorians have jetpacks, massive aerial battles, dogs oh, and cats man. living together. It was incredible. Yeah. It was this really was amazing. I, there told you are. Was, I was told she was hanging out. Look at that. Look, you're missing car. it. You're missing it. The force push. Here we go. There, mall there, back. There would have been a, a full on confrontation, which is why yeah. when, we, when they face each other in Rebels, uh, Maul absolutely knows. That's why he so knows. He calls you Lady Tano, yeah. and he knows your story, running away again. Da 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 da. da. You so, know. you know, even though the, this particular story really only exists as story ideas, some loose scripts, and things like that, um, you know. Yeah. You're sharing it right now. Yeah, we, we yeah, still consider it. Not all of it. We though, consider yeah. it to have happened, so that's how we inform yes. the writing in Rebels, yeah. because that's the history that these characters carry in their heads. So, so that. And I will say, I knew part of that, but yeah. to see it yeah. is a whole different thing. That's yeah, that so, was a beautiful, those are beautiful sketches. And, and these are all you? Yeah, just, just real quick, when George and I would talk, every single episode of Clone Wars, has a bunch of drawings that goes with it. And the shots that you see on that day, I would say about 95% of the time are shots that actually end up in the episodes. Because mm -hmm. I give all this information to the episodic directors when they do the episode, and I go over it, the whole thing. And they always did a brilliant job at you know, being faithful to the vision that George and I had from the start. So yeah, it made a great team, Amazing. it's a really great team. So the next chapter in Ahsoka's life ends up actually being quite, uh, well, first oh, of all, let's get look to this. Oh, look at that. Oh, wow. Wow, that is exciting. 
Wow, that was for a, because I, truthfully, they don't necessarily have anything to do with the story. It's just every now and then I draw Ahsoka riding a wolf, because who wouldn't want to? a wolf walker, is that what that is? And, well, the whole thing was Ahsoka's inspiration came from Mononoke, from the character San. So I was like, ah, riding a wolf is so cool. And I did have a scene when, because things go badly after you, you've done th some things and Order 66, it just goes badly. <laughs> right when it's about to be really good, yeah. it gets really bad. And so suddenly these clones are chasing you and it's, it's horrible. And these clones would chase you into this force. I'm going to tell this scene because right. I'll probably never get to do it, but then you'll know. <laughs> this so creative relationship. This is probably right too far. All right, now it's, it's fine. No it's one's going to know. No. You'll see Rogue One tomorrow and be like, I forgot everything Flynn said. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it'd be fine. It's great. So the, the clones are chasing this force, right? And I, I forget which one it was. We'll make up a name, anybody. And Collins chases them into the force, Commander Collins. And they're running in there, and uh, they're trying to find a slogan. And they come to this clearing, and there's a stone, a big stone in the clearing. And Ahsoka's sitting there on this rock, just kind of meditating, just all peaceful and calm. And the clones all get their guns out, and they're like, Commander Collins, you have to come with us. And, and she's like, you'll have to ask my friends first. And they're kind of like, what does that mean? And all of a sudden, there's this shuddering in the trees. And these big heads of these wolves come down. And the clones didn't realize that what they ran into weren't a bunch of trees, but it was a bunch of these giant wolves that have legs like trees. And the clones are like, oh my gosh. And these wolves are like, ah. And then you're up on one riding. And the clones are like, this is horrible. And they're just blasting all kinds of special effects. And you're running off on these wolves. Oh, it was great. That's amazing. So, but really this, is fun. Also, this is about as far as we got. But that was as far as I got. Yeah. But then I started to feel guilty because I like wolves and why am I doing that? And you know, it, it seems very self-serving and I stopped myself. So. <laughs> Oh, well. So it remains an untold tale. But in terms yeah. of what happens to Ahsoka after the Clone Wars, uh, this is the first time we've actually been able to, to sit down with an author, E.K. Johnston, and has worked uh, to create a Star Wars Ahsoka novel coming from Disney Press. So um, it's, it's young adult, but I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely got the, the tone, the tenor, the energy of any Star Wars story you want. And it's got, uh, uh, E.K. Johnson is, is great. I mean, we, we, we shared with her all the stuff that we're sharing with you now, mm -hmm. even more so. So that when you read this book and you're wondering, wow, there's like a reference to a fight with Maul, there's a <laughs> reference to the Siege of Mandalore. We thought it was important for you to understand that you know, she's just not inventing this from whole cloth. The author really worked with Dave and us uh, to find out where Ahsoka is in this point in her life. So. Yeah, I wanted to have a, a, a novel, that, and I got approached by publishing, can they do it? And I said, yeah, absolutely, because I've recognized that I don't want Ahsoka just to exist as an animated character. She's just a Star Wars character. And Star Wars characters exist in all forms of medium, and the more I can get exposure for her, I think it makes her even stronger as a character. So this is really the first time that there's been something done that I feel is really part of her saga that I haven't personally written, which is kind of exciting. And I made sure to be very involved. Um, my assistant Claudia made sure that I had time to read the book more than once, that I looked at the cover extensively and I made lots of notes on the outfit. You can see the outfit is what we were doing in the concept design that had, if you look closely, you see the tail of the boot monkey down there. <laughs> So it's just, it, I feel it's really authentic, and uh, E.K. did a great job uh, asking questions and then and coming through with a book that I think is going to be an exciting addition to the story of this character. You'll have to read it. I I'm can get excited. you one. You can. can you I can get your copy. Up? I can. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing cover art too. That's I mean, the cover. Just, yeah. I, yeah, I'd read that just for the cover art. That's such a cool picture. That's so, a, that's awesome. So look for it's it so soon. Cool. Yeah. And then bringing her into Rebels. Um, which, mm -hmm. you know, we managed to keep for mostly a secret for most of season one. We did. We did yeah. pretty good yeah, with we, that. Yeah, we surprised a lot of people in, in, at the end of season one, which, which was a great experience. Um, I, yes. Yeah, to go through some of those. I just started drawing Ahsoka's early on mm -hmm. for Rebels, but again, it would be self-serving to put you in Rebels season one. I didn't want Rebels to just be a uh, Clone Wars part two. I wanted the characters to stand on their own. So I would draw you a lot, but not put you in the show. <laughs> I like that one. See, it gets a star if I like it. And we were even developing the look of Rebels during this time, so I was like, what would you even look like? I don't know. 
You gotta figure it out. I tried these helmets, and you can see I put some of the rebel pilot symbols on the helmets. <laughs> not, and yeah, not feeling big, the helmets. Not feeling the helmets. You know, oh, it'd be a, come on, it'd be great for cosplay. I think of that all the time. Hey, it might be cool for cosplay, <laughs> you know. But then I thought it'd be difficult too, because what would hold that up? You tear your leku. Yeah, I got rid of it. I like the one on the right though. The, her headband became a, a, a nod to I think Aurora. Aurora's crown is very much what Ahsoka's headband in Rebels looks like. Yeah, see, the, there became this piece of armor on the center one that was very samurai-like. I found some uh, old photographs of uh, samurai women uh, from a you know, long, long time ago. And uh, that started to influence the costume because I wanted her to become more of a warrior-like looking mm -hmm. character. Wow. Yeah. Look at that. I thought maybe a blue cloak for a while, but then didn't do that. And were the white so. lightsabers always part of it? Yeah, I always wanted the white lightsabers. So I love that uh, she would have seen them with Tara Sanube. Yeah. But the white lightsaber also is just more indicative of the fact that she's not really a chosen side. She's not a Jedi, and she's certainly not a Sith. And the lightsaber color is reflected more of your internal attitude and feeling, like your soul and, and who you are. So Jedi's have this set thing of red, and, or I mean of green and blue, uh, purple if you're Sam Jackson. So, it, you know, and then you have red on the Sith. And I always thought Sith just were kind of torturous with a, a crystal and they make them bleed and that's why they're all red. Bleed is just a metaphor. So, because uh, crystals, Jedi crystals, uh, kyber crystals are just clear. They're just you know, you, you, they're not like, oh, here's a blue one. I know that's been in some games and stuff, but as George described it, that's not how it works, because yeah. then anyone could have found them easily, and they're very difficult to find. So that's why Ilum is an ice cave. You can't tell the ice from the crystal if you're a, an average person. So there's a, the force kind of protecting itself as nature tends to from time to time. And then leading uh -oh. into the end of season two. Uh-oh. Yeah. So you talked about Dave's doodles. One of the most frustrating things said by anyone who's worked with Dave is he does amazing whiteboard illustrations. Oh, no. And the eraser comes out. And then the eraser comes out because we need those whiteboards. And I'm like, and Dave doesn't care. And I don't like, care. <laughs> I'm just exploring on the whiteboard. It's a nice medium, though. So for literally months, this was at the Burbank offices of Lucasfilm down south. Uh, this was on the whiteboard, and everyone was too afraid to erase it, right? <laughs> first of all, it was like the biggest spoiler of the season. So it was, first of all, everyone was afraid that they saw it, and then they were afraid, like, how do we get, do we get rid of this? And I, I will out him now, it was, uh, th there was a story meeting that needed to happen there, and Kiri, like, we, we photographed this extensively, <laughs> and it was a meeting with Ryan Johnson regarding episode eight, and Kiri said, yeah, no, you can erase it, and he just kept emailing, are you sure? Are you sure I can erase this? You this know what I'll do? Yeah. Next time I see him, I'll be like, I can't believe you erased it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll really straight face. That was we, don't, we didn't even take a picture of it. No, we didn't, no. It's like, we, have no we have no series now. Yeah. <laughs> So, but uh, obviously Ahsoka fighting Vader is something that you drew many, many times over the years, so. It is, yeah, for a long time. And, and these, in the notebook here, I kept a separate notebook just for the final two episodes of the season. And I would be making these illustrations and uh, taking them and sending them to Simon Kimberg as he was writing it. And I'd say, I want to do this, and I want all these kind of, I'm going to have these shots that are symbolic in the way I want the scene structured. And, I added this thing where she touches the big pillar and the floor cracks and they descend into the underworld. And it just gives Simon something visual to grab onto when he's writing so he knows exactly what uh, I'm going to be doing later. So it had its own separate thing. And see, like, you can see most of these shots wound up in those episodes. And this is long before I actually shot it. So I would do these drawings and the big Sith temple, just trying to figure out what would compositionally work. I came up with the idea of the helicopter sabering and, you know, just nice moments too that I can show the story guys when we're going to stage it. I want shots like this, the Sith temple and how it was going to function. I needed to show to my design team uh, so that they could understand the level concept. And then always the, there it goes. You know, this is one version of a reveal. I was trying to figure out how do I reveal this moment. I later decided that you're the one that steps up behind him clashing. The scale thing between them is really challenging because he's very tall and she's very small. So 
it can make that difficult. But Vader's just a, a pillar of power. You know, you don't go around him, he's just there and he will destroy you. He will just cut right through you. This wow. moment of leaping up onto Vader is something I've had for years where I wanted you to knock back one, uh, his one saber then cut with the other. So I've had different versions of this. In some versions, you should know. This is for the young people, no. But in some versions, at this moment, when you hit his mask, he also, boom, you right down here. And so it was like this really kind of, you know, renaissance. It was like, oh, no. And then you see into the mask as he's got you there. The, it was too terrible because it was the last <laughs> thing you'd see. So I said, no, I'm not going to do that. There's a whole range of emotions yeah, that, that we're actually through on this panel. But it, as you can see as a filmmaker, it was exhilarating that yeah. moment. Yeah. It's like this really mm, intense thing, but probably not. That's, I didn't do that. So I'm you'd be, glad. See, I'm not mean. I'm a nice person. <laughs> the last 10 years of your life have been this kind of... Uh, this is my favorite part. <laughs> this emotional yeah. roller coaster. Look over here. I love it. I, re question mark. I requested this special. I said, we need a question mark now. So, uh, so that t-shirt, the ones, if you didn't sell some, you just put a question mark, a whole new t-shirt. Yeah. Just sew it on there. I'll do it special. I'll sew it on and be a Floney limited <laughs> question mark edition. But there's stuff to show here. Yes. So I did a series of images for tops. And uh, I believe, and I'm looking at Claudia, well, you'll be able to get these today, is that right? Right after the panel, because these are online. See, I'm old now and I don't understand, but evidently young people collect cards online and they have them <laughs> digitally. I used to actually have them as cards, which is why we call them cards. cards. Yes, yeah. These are something new that I don't understand, but they collect them this way now. It's like, you know, Pokemon, I guess. And so, these are images I made just for tops that start to explain visually, metaphorically, what the end is about. So there are only six here, but I did 10 total. You have to go to tops to get the other four. But you see, look, there's you and Vader, and they're all just red and black and white. All it's red, black. And they're, they're, so you can stare at them for hours and try to figure out what does it mean. You know, these are the most revealing here the most interesting, I think, because this starts to get into really these kind of uh, psychological subconsciousness. What does this journey into the underworld mean? Because it obviously is Ahsoka in that doorway. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I know. And so this <laughs> is going to tell you a little bit if you stare at these. It's not like if you stare at them, the image becomes something else. It's no, not it's one not of those things guy, like at the so. mall. It's not a magic trick. Yeah. It's just to try to understand the metaphors and the symbolism and the meaning of this journey, which is a, a very classic journey. Literally, the mm. more images you show, yes. the more questions come yes. up. It, isn't that about true? This. Oh, about this you one? want to talk about this? Oh, yes. what, what questions does this image raise? What do we think this means? What's the symbolism here? I don't know. Well, you know what? This actually, uh, Funko is giving us the exclusive reveal for you guys today. So you're the first to see this image. And Funko is finally doing an Ahsoka pop. Um, and it comes out this fall. I love that this has to be you. Yes. Like this has to be something you brought to the panel because <laughs> yeah, everything else <laughs> is red and black is serious. <laughs> And then there's this. It's so exciting. It's think, fun. I, it's good. I, 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 I think we needed that. a breather after. She looks yeah. so alive. Yes. She does. <laughs> there. She really does. Right there. Excellent word choice. I've been wanting this for a long time. I love it. Well, I think it's so cool. We're going to do it's like one of my an favorite unboxing things. when it comes in. It's, it'll be available exclusively at Hot Topic this fall. So um, very right. exciting. Yeah. And she's beautiful. She looks awesome, huh? She does. Yeah. I love it. All one right. more thing. We've got one more, one more thing. thing. So, you know, the more and more we get into the untold elements of Clone Wars, for instance, the less and less there is, like, you know, what we've shown you is what we have available, essentially. It's artwork, it's stories, it's things like that. We, we've really mined as much of that's, that's presentable as possible because uh, of where we were in production at that point in time. But we did find something uh, that we did want to share with you. So this is going back to the Nixakami story. Um, this is all 
just as a caveat, this is all super temp animation. It's just really just blocking low res stuff. Very similar to what you showed at Celebration. Yes. Like Bad Batch, yeah. any of that like stuff. Batch. Yeah, because we Animatics. shot it all in layout. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, here's a little bit that would bring us back, bring Ahsoka back into our lives in this in this particular storyline. So if you could run the video, that would be great. Okami! Do you have what you owe me? Hey, Pintu. I was just coming to see you. I've been helping a new client rebuild her speeder. I was waiting for her to pay me the last few credits she owed me. So, where's my money? I'm a few credits short. Then this is going to hurt pretty bad, Okami. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is, will it hurt me or you? <laughs> You're doing pretty good. You can go get help anytime you want, Ahsoka. But only if you let me stay free of charge. Free? No way! Fine, free of charge. Just go get help. Oh, that hurt. I think you want to leave now. Tell Okami his debts are far from being paid. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so, we, we literally have like five minutes left for a Q&A, but if, if you have a burning question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wonder. <laughs> I think we could do like two or three questions. Do we have, uh, do we have a mic over here? You know what, I see a hand right here. Why don't we just go, why don't you come up here to the aisle and we'll bring your mic right here. And then we'll do one more uh, back there in the middle, right there with your hand up. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, go ahead and go to the mic. My nine-year-old daughter sent me on a quest, oh, I'm nervous, <laughs> to give Ashley a drawing that she made of Suga. Oh, that's Could amazing. Could I give it to her, please? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'd yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Drawing for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go over here. This question right here. That's great. <laughs> so glad. Go ahead. Uh, oh, well, um, will you be doing signings later? Well, so, yeah, kind of. Um, <laughs> I, I came just for today. Unfortunately, I have to leave after today. But at 12.30, go to the Star Wars show stage. We're going to do an Ahsoka Lives photo. And please, <laughs> I would love everyone if you can come. Um, to that photo, and then after that, so I'll, I'll sign for whoever I can during that time, and then I'm gonna go to the celebration store from 1.30 to 2.30, and I'll sign for everyone I can in there. And then unfortunately I have to catch a flight, but I will sign for as many people as I can during that time. <laughs> awesome. We have time for a couple more. Let's do, go ahead, you wanna jump up to the mic there? Go ahead, yeah, just jump up to the mic. And then do we have another one over here? Go ahead. Go ahead. So throughout Star Wars, we see Force users, whether it be Master and Apprentice or Brother and Sister, have a sort of like a Force connection between the two of them. Did Anakin and Ahsoka ever have that while Ahsoka was off on her own on Coruscant? Yeah, I, I would definitely think so. The thing about Anakin and Ahsoka, when, when you know someone well, 
you can kind of tell where they are in the force. Not like a metal detector per se, but you know, it's an extension of that idea that like you'll have stories where parents get a feeling that their kids are in trouble. They might be somewhere else in the world, and then the kid calls and something bad has happened, or you feel that your mother or father becomes sick. And this is, this is real stuff that people talk about that happens in our world. So you extend that to the force and you say that, so they, there's always this feeling that Anakin's around, that he's alive, that things are going on. But when Order 66 happens and Ahsoka reaches into the force, she actually can't feel Anakin anymore. He's gone, he's missing from the force. And that's what leads her to believe that he died sometime yeah. at the end of Order 66. And that's why she does not believe that uh, he could be Darth Vader. She doesn't believe it, she denies it, she, she can't even imagine that he would become that person because that's not the person she knows. So This was an element that uh, E.K. Johnson was really curious about because we're, we're catching up with Ahsoka in the novel right after the events of Order 66. So she wanted to know, what, what does she think? Like if she felt, tried to reach out to Anakin, what would she find? And, and this is one of the things that we clarified and it's in the book. That's a great, great question. Thank you. Right here. And this is our, our last one, unfortunately, but thank you. Uh, this question's for Dave. Uh, I'd just like some clarification on the season finale of, uh, <laughs> for season two of Rebels. In the moments after Ahsoka strikes Vader, who is calling her name? Is that Vader or is that Anakin? Is she knocking him into clarity for a moment? Mm. Or is this just a ruse to kind of lure, lure her into a false sense of security? Well, it's my feeling that it's, it's not a ruse. I think that it's a uh, extension of the concept of let me look on you with my own eyes. That I didn't think that Anakin could see her if he had that mask on. And I think that there's a moment that when he's kind of broken from that mask that he does call to her because he realizes it's her. You know, Vader is a Vader and Anakin is Anakin. So you're right to kind of refer to them as two different people, but they are the same person. So it's very tricky. But Vader is kind of unrepentant and he wants to destroy her. There's nothing else he wants more. Anakin is somewhere deep buried inside. You have to be careful though, because nothing can change Vader until Luke. Yeah. Nothing can change until Luke. There's no way Ahsoka could bring Anakin back. She can get a glimpse of him. So she realizes the truth. And then it's up to her what she does with that. So. It's not a tactic to lure her in. There's this, I wanted a suspended moment where she has to deal with the reality and he has to resolve that he's still going to destroy her because he can't be that good person he wants to be. Only the love of his son is going to bring him back from that. And that's why the first time he says her name, it's James Earl Jones over Matt Lanter's voice. The second time it's Matt Lanter over James's voice. And then the third is all Matt. So you have this kind of deconstruction through the voice of who's in control. But by the end, when it's Anakin, he still says, then you will die. So you know clearly that this is the agenda of the day. So the only thing I'll say in closing, which is maybe fair, maybe not fair, and I wasn't necessarily going to say this, but I can't believe the reason why we can do this panel is because of the fan support we get for this specific character. When we started with her, George and I had a moment looking at the early days and stuff, and he, he and I were like, well, this is either gonna work or people are gonna hate it. But there's not much in between when you give Anakin a Padawan. And you dare, you know, back then in 2005 and eight to make it a little girl, mm -hmm. especially with the way that she behaved. But George always had a great mind for having a bigger picture. And we evolved the characters we went, and she grew into somebody that I think, obviously a lot of fans have come to love and respect. And I, we at Lucasfilm, really appreciate that. That's why this character persists, persists because you guys show such tremendous support for her. And I think we all feel like we earned that because she wasn't universally liked in the beginning, as I warned you. <laughs> so the only spoilerific thing that I would say, and perhaps you will find some type of relaxation for this for your long flight home, but because of, and I'm rarely, 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 rarely ever affected by fan opinion. I just can't allow myself to be. You get a wrong story. But I was very adamant after the season two finale that that was it uh, for Ahsoka on Rebels. I'm not going to say what form any story would take place. But after the reaction, I don't know. I don't know, I might, 
It just might be possible. It doesn't necessarily mean what some of us would want it to mean, maybe. But it might be possible to see her again. She might have something to do, maybe. Dave Filoni, Pablo Adamo, and Ashley Eckstein, Ahsoka, the untold.